Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we pray now that you will open your word to us and show us wonderful things there. Ask us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, there's a lot of material that we've covered in these three chapters, but it all is of a piece. It's one uh, section of, of literature, and uh, I'll show you that at the end of the uh, lesson. We'll look at the literary structuring of it so you can see how it all fits together. And uh, it all uh, kind of goes together with some of the things we were looking at last week. Last week we looked at the naming of the daughters, or excuse me, of the sons of uh, Leah. And uh, Leah, you remember, was the, the unchosen uh, wife, and uh, she was the unwanted. She was the quote unquote despised or hated or not loved one. Mm-hmm. And uh, yet she, in all of her uh, trouble, she discovered some things about God, and that was reflected in the names of her children. I'll we'll just review from last week and then I'm going to erase all this. First, she had a son, Reuben, um, which means, see, a son. And the divine perspective was that the Lord saw that Leah was unloved and opened her womb. Okay? So the Lord saw that she was unloved and opened her womb. That was the divine perspective, which is presented in the editorial comment. Remember last week we said that (coughs) when you're reading a biblical narrative, things happen that are good, things happen that are bad. You can't assume that what the various characters are doing is right or wrong. For example, uh, Jacob is doing some kind of voodoo with the uh, striped sticks and everything, putting them in front. Is that He did it, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Does that mean that that's uh, divinely inspired or that that's divinely uh, commended? Not necessarily. We have to find out what God really approves of. Two ways. The most safe way is by looking at what the divine commentary is. What does the narrator say about the things that are happening? What is the divine perspective that's given? What does God say about it? But there's also the perspective of the characters involved. And in this story especially, what they say tends to match precisely, in most cases, with the divine perspective. And so what does Leah say? She says, the Lord has seen my misery. Now my husband will love me. Now, the first part matches the divine perspective, right? The second part, we never really find out if it's true or not. But at a certain point, it doesn't seem to matter anymore to, to lay as much as it has. And maybe that's even an overstatement of it. But God blesses her even though her husband does not seem to love her. She has a second son, Simeon, whose name means her. And she says, the Lord heard that I am unloved. Okay? This is also consistent with the divine perspective, which was that the Lord had seen that Leah was unloved and had taken action on her behalf in the first case. Now, there's no specific divine comment tied to this second child, but it fits under the divine perspective given at the beginning. Thirdly, she has uh, Levi, and she says, at last my husband will become attached. Okay? God had not said that. We don't know if that's true or not. We know that it is, does tend to be true that when you have children, you do become more attached to your spouse. That much I can guarantee. Mm-hmm. If I ever think to myself, you know, I've had just about enough of this, and I'm ready to just pack up and hit the road, the very next thought is, what about Anna? What about George? What about Mary? What about Bella? Babies do kind of tend to attach you to your your spouses, and uh, it, it's part of the extra glue that God gives us to hold our, our, our marriages together. But we're not told that he becomes attached to her, but you notice that she's focused all the way down on her husband. Now my husband will love me. Uh, the Lord has heard that I'm on love. Implication, now my husband will love me. Thirdly, now my husband will become attached to me. But she has a fourth son, whose name is Judah, which means praised. And what does she say here? 
Now I will praise the Lord. And we noticed here last week that the focus seems to shift off of her husband, at least for a moment here, and onto the God. Her husband did not want her. Her husband does not love her. But God loves her. Not only does God not, not only does God love her, God demonstrates his love for her in that he sees her misery. And we pointed out last week that this seeing is not easy to translate unless we think about the way we use this word um, our, ourselves. Uh, Marion, the old folks, when they said, uh, Marion, look after Nancy. What does that mean? It doesn't mean just watch where she goes, right? It means to take care of her. And if we could understand <coughs> how the Hebrew language is functioning here, it's not just that God has visually seen her misery, it's that God has looked into it, that God has looked into it in order to look after her. That's the implication. God is seeing to her needs. Same thing with the with, with this word. Um, we we, we, we uh, say, uh, Georgie, listen to me. Listen to me now. Listen to Daddy. But we don't mean just listen to what I'm saying with your ears. We mean listen so that you may take action in accordance with what you've heard. God does not just hear what she's going through. He hears in such a way that he now takes action on her behalf because of what she is suffering. I'd like you to open your Bibles up, if you would, to Psalm 115, verses 4 through 7. Okay? Psalm 115, verses 4 through 7. And uh, as soon as you get it, especially if you have the King James Version today, it's, it's great to read this in the King James Version. Mary, would you like a Bible that you can tell where the verses are? No, no. <laughs> okay. I have no glasses when I can't <laughs> All right. Does anybody have it? Donna, do you have it? Uh -huh. there are, uh, their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. That's good enough. Okay? I want you to see here that what, what is being presented to us in this story is God, the Lord, God of Israel, in direct contrast with idols. By the way, in the story you just read, what did the household gods, quote unquote, of, of Laban do for him? Nothing. Nothing. Not only do they do nothing, but you have to understand that the Hebrew ideas of kosherness, they are underneath a menstruating woman. And so the gods are not only helpless, they are unable to help Laban, and they are in just an absolutely humiliated position in this story. Not the Lord. The Lord who is invisible. He's not, you can't see him. Can you? But he sees you. And he hears you. And he takes action on behalf of even the last and the lowest and the least esteemed among them, Leah. And he takes care of her. And that's our God. Okay? That's the God that we worship. Okay, that's, that's all I want to look into in the review from... Uh, last week. And now I would like to look at uh, a verse. I'd like you to look up Psalms. Psalms chapter 75 verses 5 through 7. Psalm 75 verses 5 through 7. And when you have it, please read it for us. Lift up your, lift not up your horn on high, neither speak with a stiff neck. 
For to come to fulfillment is neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge, who makes the flow, and who makes it fall. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you heard that. Let me read it in the uh, again. Promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge who putteth down one and setteth up another. Mm-hmm. This section of stories is full of what uh, the commentator Walter Brueggemann calls inversions. He looks at this whole passage from the perspective of inversions. God is constantly turning things upside down and inside out. Or I should say, to start with, things are constantly being turned inside out and upside down. And that, of course, is not just true here, but it's been true in this whole uh, Jacob saga. There are several instances where the fortunes of one character or another are turned upside down in the, these stories. And so the, the, the question that keeps pushing itself forward is what is the cause of these inversions? There are a lot of human means employed. Is that what's causing things to be turned upside down? <coughs> um, for example, um, when Rebecca was pregnant, Jacob's mother, God spoke to her and he said, two nations are struggling within your womb and the elder is going to serve the younger. Okay? That's a predicted inversion. So, on the one hand, God has predicted that this is going to happen, but then how does it come about? Well, Jacob supplants Esau both as heir to the birthright and then Secondly, as heir to the eternal blessing. But this happens, at least appears to happen, through very ungodly manipulations Mm -hmm. on the part of both Rebecca and carried out, the idea is Rebecca's and it's carried out by Jacob. Mm -hmm. He deceives his blind father to bring this to pass. And um, God helps those who help themselves seems to be Jacob's motto. Yeah. He he probably had been told from his mother what God had told her. And he says, well, God said it, now it's up to me to make it happen. Yeah. Okay. By the way, that's how we sometimes ap- approach evangelism, right? That's how we sometimes approach church work. I know God made these promises, but now it's up to me to, to really make it happen. Well, mm-hmm. we have to be very careful with those kinds of ideas because... Um, we, we are invited to participate in God's work, but we're invited to participate in God's work according to God's yeah. ways, yeah. right? And we dare not pick up human uh, methods to carry forth God's will, especially when those methods are in direct conflict with, with God's character. <coughs> and so Jacob takes action, but his actions are lying, they're deceptive, and uh, God's plan is carried forward. Uh, is that uh, is that what God wants? Well, inversions. Hearing that Esau plans to kill him now, Rebecca sends Jacob away. And so again, the question comes up: Is God's promise something mm-hmm. she has to ensure by her own manipulations, or is God's promise something that God will accomplish in spite of her? Well, if Jacob is going to survive long enough to be served by the elder brother, uh, served anything but a death blow with a sword Mm -hmm. or a club or something, Mm -hmm. he figures he'd better hightail it out of there and save his skin. If his skin is going to be served, he's going to have to uh, preserve it long enough for that service to take place at some later time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he takes his mother's advice and flees across the Euphrates, the land of his ancestors. Remember, this is a story of inversions. Mm -hmm. There he who will be served, that's what R.C. Sproul calls his wife on the basis of some old corny movie, uh, she who must be obeyed. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, here he who must be obeyed has to become obedient to his uncle. He who will be served must become the servant to Mm -hmm. Laban. He 
He comes empty-handed, and he is at the mercy of this very tricky uncle. And so it seems that his fortunes have been turned on their head. There, uh, in the land of his ancestors, uh, an inversion uh, that uh, just reeks of poetic justice takes place. And we've talked about this several times, that the one who deceived his blind elder in the matter of the blessing, right, to get the blessing, now gets his comeuppance. He who deceived his blind father in the darkness of his blindness now is deceived himself in the darkness of his marriage tent. He had bargained for Rachel, but when he could see clearly the day after the wedding, behold, it was mm -hmm. Leah, right? Upside down, right? Here's a sister he wanted, here's a sister he didn't want, but when he wakes up the next morning, it's all upside down. He's got the one he didn't want, and the one that he wanted is, is nowhere to be, nowhere within his reach. And so, um, Brueggemann uh, lays out this uh, inversion uh, motif in the form of a, a chiasmus. So we've seen this before, right? Let's take a quick look at it. My handwriting is horrendous. Uh, but in this chiasmus, and remember, it's if, if you're reading, you're reading, you know, this way, okay? These things are taking place in, in, in order. And so at the beginning of this section of the story, you have the empty-handed fugitive, okay? In chapter 29, verses 1 through 30, the empty-handed fugitive appears in Mesopotamia there, okay? And then, secondly, there is another empty person, which is Rachel, okay? She is barren. By the way, this theme of barrenness and the fixing of that barrenness by the Lord God omnipotent is common in these passages, right? Mm -hmm. Sarah couldn't have babies. Rebecca couldn't have babies. And now, Rachel can't have babies. But we're just looking within this section of scripture, for chapters 29 through 31. And in the middle of this, chapter 30, verse 22, God remembers, not Leah this time, but God remembers Rachel. Okay? And he hears her prayer. Now again, on the outside, what was part of Rachel's way of hoping to get pregnant? She took two tacks. What was her first thing? She complained to her husband. Give me children or I die. We looked at that last week. <coughs> and Jacob gets very angry as any man would who is not, you know, giving forth the babies that are expected of him. And he says, who do you think I am? And I know you have a high estimation of me, but I'm not God. Okay? I, I, in the old days they called their husbands Lord, but it wasn't that Lord. It wasn't capital L-O-R-D. It was just a respectful term, but he, he didn't. And so he says, "God's the one who gives life. God's the one who takes life." By the way. And I'm not God. Like the old T-shirt the kid had on, he said, "There are two things we know for sure. One, there is a God. Two, you're not Him." Uh -huh. right? Well, Jacob knew there is a God, but I'm not Him. And so Rachel, you're barking up the wrong tree here. I can't give you children. I can go through the motions, but I can't give you children. And so, God is the one who remembers and hears. What was the other method that Rachel employed to try to get children? It's a little bit murky. Mandrakes, mandrakes okay? We don't know a whole lot about mandrakes, but the, the idea is that they're supposed to somehow improve uh, sexual virility. And so, it's a type of plant, uh, fruit, uh, and... Uh, I think we, we still have them. I mean, we know what a mandrake plant is, but the idea was that it would increase Jacob's ability to, uh, or, or Rachel's ability, I'm not sure which, or presumably though Jacob, she would feed them to Jacob and he'd be able to have children. But that's not what the birth is attributed to. It's not attributed to Jacob in any direct way. It's not attributed to the mandrakes. When Rachel has the chance to speak, she declares 
that it is the Lord who has given her. So we'll look at that in, in a moment. Okay? And so in the rest of the scripture, God adds the son, and Rachel rejoices. And then finally, we come out of the story with Jacob no longer an empty handed fugitive, and Rachel's no longer an empty an empty uh, armed mother. Rachel is a joyful mother of children, and Jacob is a man of power and authority as he stands to deal with his opponent, Laban. Okay? So that's one way of kind of putting that, that together. And by the way, I will give you a handout uh, in the future so that you, you will have all of this in a visible way. Um, Mom, you told us before, but what is chaos in there? It's just this, these corresponding, it's a, it's a literary structure in which the story can be broken up into corresponding elements that, that come down usually into some kind of center. Sometimes they don't come to a specific center like this, sometimes they're just the two matching things in the middle, but it's, it's corresponding elements that match in the course of the story. And usually, it, they're, they're, I mean, the ones that are for sure are usually fairly clear. I'll show you one at the end that's very clear, which includes the kiss at the beginning of the story and the kiss at the end of the story. Mm -hmm. There's a kiss hello and there's a kiss goodbye. And so we could call this whole thing the, you know, between two kisses would mm -hmm. be a good way to title the sermon or the lesson if you wanted to. And we'll look at that after, after a while. Okay? So the power is with the Lord. By the way, let's look up Zechariah 1 verse 12, which is the other the other side of Psalm uh, 115, 4 through 6. Chapter 1, verse 12. If somebody would read that when you read it. And the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the sins of Judah, against which you have been angry with his son? I'm sorry, I called this Zephaniah. Not Zechariah, Zephaniah. I got the Z's mixed up. I'm so proud that I remember the chapter and verse. <laughs> <laughs> Zechariah 1, verse 12. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their knees. They say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Okay. Do you hear that phrase? That, see, one mistake is to think that the idols can help you. Right? Because that's a, that's a huge mistake, because they have eyes that they don't see, ears that they can't hear, lips that they can't speak. They are completely helpless to come to your aid. But another mistake is to say, you know what? God, whether he can or not, is irrelevant. God is not going to do one thing or the other thing. And so just do whatever you want. God's not going to punish you if you do the wrong thing. God's not going to reward you if you do the right thing. So you approach something like Ivan, for example. Uh, and you say, well, just not enough money in my uh, salary to, to be able to tithe. And the pastor says, trust the Lord. And you say, pastor, come on. I mean, we come to church, we go through these motions, we like to be around nice people and, and learn how to behave nicely, we like to have little dinners, we like to get the ladies together and have tea and stuff like that. But please, you can't really think that God will help us if we do this. Or, harm us if we don't do it. It's just really up to us, isn't it? We just live in a mechanical world, and the idea of God is kind of a nice idea, like Santa Claus. Hmm. You know, we tell children about Santa Claus, and we go through all the motion. We, we hang their stockings up, we put out milk and cookies, but everybody knows there's really no such thing as Santa Claus. Daddy comes in and drinks the milk and eats the cookies in the middle of the night. Or Mama does if she gets there first sometimes. But there's no such thing as Santa Claus. We can't really depend on him to bring our gifts, nor can we really depend on the Lord. God's not going to help us, nor will God ever harm us. 
Well, that's a, that's just as empty a religion as this one. Mm-hmm. I was reading about a, a pastor. Uh, they were out in California, and there was a, a family, mm-hmm. and they had planted their crops. They, they started out with almost nothing, and they planted all their crops in the San Joaquin Valley, and there was a sandstorm that blew in, and it covered up all the cotton, and it, it destroyed the, the crops. And uh, the people told the pastor, they said, Pastor, you know, we want to we want to do the right thing, we want to give the church and so forth, but they said, we, we can't, because, no, no, that, that's not what they said. They, they, they said, you know, these our crops have been destroyed, and these guys were tithers, and the pastor knew they were. And he said, you know what? God's word is not empty. God promised that if we tithe, that he's going to give back a blessing. And so he got down, I think he scooped up a, a handful of the dirt or something, and he prayed that God would bless these crops. And he got up and he said, that settles it. We, God, God's word is good, and we prayed. And sure enough, the crop came in. They called him a couple days later and said, that's the cotton came up. Threw all that sand and everything, and they ended up with a crop. And that man became, I forget what it was, the tomato king of, of uh, the San Joaquin Valley or something like that. I can get you the exact story if you'd like to see it. But God blessed them. But I want you to notice this also. God gave a promise, right? And then they also pray on the basis of that promise. Sometimes we think that if God promised, that we don't need to bother to pray. But I would suggest to you that the safest way is to take the promise with you to your prayers, and then you will see the fullest blessing of God in my life. In my life. <coughs> okay. So, who is the one who remembers and hears? God. By the way, that word remembers, we've seen it before, haven't we? We saw it with which characters in the beginning of Genesis? There's a guy floating on a boat with a whole bunch of animals. No. And uh, the no. floods were not receding. It had rained in port for 40 days. And now they're, they're out there just floating along. And finally it says that God remembered Noah, right? And came to his aid. And we see that phrase repeated. Read through Genesis again. You'll see this comes up a couple of times. It doesn't just mean that he remembered it means that he remembered in order to do something for them. Okay. So the center of this little chiasmus is the key to interpreting how Jacob goes from emptiness to wealth. How he goes from having nothing in his hands to having his hands full of flocks and herds and, um, and babies and all kinds of wealth. Uh, by the way, there is a foreshadowing, isn't there? This exodus from the east will later be duplicated in an exodus from Egypt, where they come back out of Egypt. Do they come out empty-handed? Mm-hmm. No, they don't. Mm-hmm. They don't come out of Egypt empty-handed. The Egyptians load them with gifts, gold and silver, mm-hmm. precious things. And the Israelites come out of Egypt with their hands full, just like Jacob comes out of Mesopotamia with his hands full of, of, of goods. And so, uh, but the, here's the point, both in the editorial commentary of the narrative and also in the mouths of the story's characters, um, we see that... Um, God is blessing Jacob. That the reason for the inversions in his life are nothing but the power of God. And you notice this. In the mouth of the story's characters, the good, the bad, and the ugly, they all speak univocally about the fact that God has blessed Jacob. Mm -hmm. So here are all the different means that were employed. Mandrakes were employed. Uh, putting striped sticks in the water were employed. Uh, Laban tried to go against Jacob by all of, by you know changing his wages and doing this, that, and the other thing. But when they speak, every single one of them, whether it's Leah or Rachel or Jacob or Laban, the most unlikely advocate for God, each of them declares 
that the reason Jacob's going out safely and full is because of God's blessing. Brueggemann, Walter Brueggemann, the, the uh, commentator that I mostly uh, utilize for this lesson, uses this phrase. He calls God the hidden but effective inverter. Mm -hmm. yeah, the hidden but effective inverter. Idols are very visible, mm -hmm. but they can't help you. God is unseen, and he's helping all the way through the story. He's in the details of the story. God is the inverter. It's not Jacob's breeding tricks that turn things around. It's not Rachel's breeding trick with the mandrakes that turns things around. It's not Laban's lies and manipulations with wives and wages that, that changes things. The one thing turning things inside out and upside down is God. So let's, let's look at what the characters say very specifically. And this will give you guys a chance to read a little bit. Uh, first are the comments made by Leah in chapter 30, verse 32, 33, and 35. Okay, so let's look at chapter 30, verses 32, 33, and 35. This is somewhat of a review. I think it's worth uh, reading again. Who would read 30, verse 32? About the speckled sheep? Okay, I'm sorry. How about, uh, how about chapter 30, <coughs> verse 27? And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, pray. For I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Okay, that's Laban. Let's look at verse 30 of that same chapter. Laban observes that the Lord has blessed him because of Jacob being there. For the little that thou hast before a king is increased into a multitude, and the Lord hath blessed thee by my coming. But now, when shall I travel for mine own house also? Okay, that's Jacob speaking, mm -hmm. right? So Laban, the, the you know, the, the, the enemy, the bad guy in the story, he admits that the Lord is in Jacob. Mm -hmm. And that he himself has been blessed because of Jacob's presence in his midst. By the way, Jacob is the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, who we know today as the Jews. Right? As the Jews. Why don't you just hold that thought? I'm going to comment on it very briefly in a minute, but I think it's significant that with Jacob, and in Jacob is contained all the twelve tribes of Israel, when Jacob is present with him, the Lord blesses even Laban because of Jacob's presence. Okay. He recognizes that. For all of his complaints of, well, you robbed me, you took my daughters, you took my flocks, you took my herds, he has still been blessed. That's all, you know, boulder dash. But he knows. Otherwise, he would have been glad to get rid of Jacob. Yeah, get out of here because, he, you know, you're just causing me to become poor. Mm -hmm. that, that's not really what's happened. What's happened is because Jacob has been with him, he has been blessed. Okay? Now, let's look at the chapter 30, verses 42 and 43. For another one of these comments. Mm -hmm. Chapter 30, verses 42 and 43. For the feebler of the flock, he would not lay down there. So the feebler would be Laban's, and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly, and had large flocks, female servants, and male servants, and families and orphans. Okay, I must have made a few mistakes here. So, those watching via television, please disregard that last reference. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try 31 verses 3 through 13 and see what happens there. Chapter 31, verses 3 through 13. But then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah 
to his flock in the field, and said to them, I see your father's attitude, and he is not friendly toward me. So, as formerly, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that I have served your father with all of my strength. Let your father, yet your father has treated me in touch with me just ten times. However, God did not allow him to hurt me. If you sow dust, the speckle shall be your wages, then all the cloud. Go out from the speckle, and if you sow dust, the strike shall be your wages, then all the cloud. Go out for the strike. Thus, God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to you. And it came about at the time when I was walked with Maiden, that I lifted up my eyes and saw in the dream. They pulled from the elbows, which were the wind, pushed by the speckles from the mouth. Then the angel of the God of the said to me in the dream, to Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up now your eyes and see that all the male goats which are amazing are striped, speckled, and all four. I have seen all that Laban has done to do it to you. I am the God of Bethlehem, where you anointed the pillow, where you made a bow to you. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of the Okay. So I want you to see there that in the events that you see in the story, you see Jacob doing this and that with striped sticks and all this stuff and putting them in the trough and, and waiting until the healthy ones are coming out and, and then not breeding them when the when the uh, when the weak ewes are there or the weak rams are there, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But when he's honest about what happened, he explains it as you see here, that it was the Lord who had blessed him. Mm-hmm. That's the same perspective that Laban had, you think? I mean, is it possible that Laban could not have known that he never tried to spy on Jacob and see what he was doing? He might have laughed at him with all his little tricks he was trying to do. This stuff is never going to work. I mean, Laban knew that. He'd been shepherd for a long time. It was God that was blessing. And that's what I want you to see is that from the mouth of all the characters keeps coming this message that this was the Lord's doing. And no matter what changed, in the arrangements that, that Laban had with Jacob, he changed with Jacob's wages ten times. Can you imagine working for a boss? I had my wages changed one time by a boss, and I was so upset that I, I uh, got out of that situation and, and never, went, never went back again. But ten times this happened. Jacob was kind of stuck. He didn't have the kind of options that we have today. But isn't that encouraging to you? If you belong to the Lord, you could have a, a, a boss over you. You could have an ethnic group over you. You could have a, uh, a government against you. I read my uh, newsletter this time. I hope I don't get barbecued for it, but I put it like it is. Mm-hmm. And yet, if God is with you, who can be against you? I mean, the flight answer to this. Okay. Um, the interesting thing to me is that, 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 that two who uh, are very much aware of God's help are Leah and Laban. Um, by the way, Laban's comments are parallel to uh, a, a statement by King Abimelech. Look back in Genesis 26, verses 28 through 30. This is King Abimelech and his people talking. And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with them. And he said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and me, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have 
sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast and made it eat and drink. That's it. Okay. That was Isaac, the king of Dimelech. Well, what we're seeing here now is that Jacob now is the blessed of the Lord. It started with Abraham, right? And the blessing passed down, a very specific kind of blessing passed down to Isaac. And now a very specific kind of blessing is passing down to Jacob. And all of his children are going to be blessed, but there's going to be a very specific blessing that will pass down through the line of Judah that is going to bring forth David and ultimately will bring forth um, Jesus. And I think it's kind of neat that that line comes not from the beloved Rachel, mm. but it comes from the quote-unquote hated Leah. I don't know if somebody didn't like that phrase in last week. Hated, that was the same. Uh, it didn't feel very good. Okay. Let's uh, let's look at Laban. Laban says that he had learned by quote divination of the Lord's blessing upon Isaac. And the Bibles have different translations of that word. Some of them say he learned by experience. Some say he learned by divination. I think there's probably a play on words here in that the word divination can also be translated as experience. Um, what he learns about Jacob through his hocus pocus is obvious to anyone who's got a set of eyeballs, isn't it? If you know that there is a Lord and you're observing Jacob's life, you don't need any hocus pocus to discern that God has been blessing him, blessing him, blessing him, blessing him. He changed his wages ten times and every time the guy came up smelling like roses. You threw him in the manure, and he came up smelling like roses. You threw him in the mud puddle, he came up clean. Obviously, God is with him. And I think this is somewhat of a mockery, probably, in between the two possible translations, you get the reality that um, what he learns about Jacob is that God has been blessing him. Laban has been the indirect recipient of such blessings. And uh, I'm not sure I could defend this proposition under fire, but I, wa I want to at least mention it as a personal observation. And maybe I could defend it under fire. You know, the two places where the Jewish people were safe and secure in modern history were England, up until they sort of turned against the state of Israel in the... Uh, if you study the history, there were some incidents where they really kind of did some dirty pull with the Israelis. Um, but historically, the two safest places, I think, for Jews were probably England and then America. You can even read George Washington making statements that the Jewish people are welcome to live here and to try to prosper here. And seldom in history, in fact, I would, I would venture to say never in history, have you seen the level of wealth and security and blessing and victory mm -hmm. than you see in England and the United States in modern history. Mm -hmm. I, I, that may not be accidental. In fact, you can you could probably trace the, the relative decline of the British Empire back to when they began to sort of shift against Israel. Mm -hmm. Now there are a lot of other aspects to that decline. Um, but at least I want to just make this, I want to just say this observation, that those places where the Jews have been free and secure have been mightily blessed places. Mm -hmm. I don't have any supernatural divination to explain that, but you can observe it by just plain looking. And I would suggest also if you want to look at Germany, Germany was thriving mm -hmm. while the Jewish people were secure there. Germany was one of the relatively safe places for Jews until Hitler rose to power. Much better to be a Jew, I think, in Germany than in Poland or some of the other places historically. Well, what happened in Germany after they turned on the Jews? There has seldom been a devastation equal to the devastation and the humiliation that Germany suffered after World War II. In fact, when I was a kid, this might surprise us because we think of Germans as very proud people. The lowest national self-esteem in the world when I was a kid, when they measured it, I don't know how to measure such things was among the Germans. Mm -hmm. They had just been so completely deflated by the end of the And by the way, the 
just got half the country back from captivity under the Russians. We robbed every single thing of value, took everything away from East Germany. Mm -hmm. When they left, they sucked it dry, and West Germany has been having to support them uh, financially ever, I think, ever since. And that's still going on. But what does the Bible say? I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And there's some uh, strains of Reformed theology that um, say, well, no, that's not true anymore. Those promises all belong to the church in a very specific way. Now, I would be very careful about it. So my Reformed brothers will be very careful with that kind of conclusion. It is true that we can grapple with the people of God. We are now the Israel of God. But there also seems to be a a blessing upon those that bless the Jews and a cursing that comes upon those who uh, would seek to harm them. Okay. Um, so that's uh, no extra charge for that. And mm -hmm. I, I don't put that within the, within the, uh, you know, most of what I teach is this is what the Bible says is you have to do. I don't put that in that category, okay? That's just food for thought. Okay, the so Corrie Ten Boom, the famous Dutch woman who took care of the Jews during World War II, mm -hmm. she said of the Nazis, she said, I pity them because they have touched the apple of God's eye. Mm -hmm. And she knew that God's justice would not remain silent for her. Mm -hmm. And she, she prayed. Mm -hmm. Okay. As we conclude this lesson, uh, we need to turn back a few pages to the theophany that prefaces these chapters. In other words, there is a hint of what is to come before we get to this point. Let's, let's look back at um, Jacob's dream. Let me just read it to you. You guys can take a look, okay? This goes back to before Jacob arrived. He, he has left his parents' home because his brother's going to kill him, but he has not yet arrived in Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back into this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, it means house of God. But the name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which, you, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, it's a direct prayer, I will give a full tenth to you. You know, there's no commandment up to that point. Thou shalt give God ten percent. This is before the Ten Commandments were given. It's before the Torah was given. Just before the, you know, Moses gave them all the commandments. There's no book of Leviticus at this point. No book of Exodus or Numbers. No book of Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. How does he know? They're a full tenth. Not to criticize one of my predecessors. Uh, 
instructions on a modern tithe, right, which was not a full tenth. I will give a full tenth of what you give me. And by the way, he recognizes that what you will have will be what God has given him. For him it is going to be obvious because he went out with nothing. And so it's going to be obvious. Well, Jacob will have offspring, so the promised line of blessing will continue through him. He will have bread to eat and clothing to wear in spades. He's going to go out a wealthy man. He must lead the land of the Arameans safely and with his children, otherwise they would not be able to arrive in the promised land as God had promised they would. That's why it's the promised land. That's part of it, right? For all the crazy means that they employ along the way, the means of their blessing is ever and always the power of the promise-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and, yes, Jacob. I think that's a good place to uh, include our, our study today. Yes, Donna. When um, Jacob says, no, God says, okay, and you hold on with you and you keep you in all places where you are those, and you bring you again to the same, mm-hmm. that's God, right? Yes. You know what? There's, there's, there's so much overlap. Uh, there, what, what Brueggemann does, this this uh, this commentator really has insight into the into these. He takes several of the psalms and he shows how these psalms tie into the story. Yeah, how po- possibly, I, I, I mean, he doesn't explain how. I don't think. But as I read it, I think. Oh, I just wonder if the psalmist was meditating on these stories as he wrote the psalm. Mm-hmm. Um, just one example, Psalm 124, and the last verse of this will be familiar. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, then they would have swallowed us up alive when our anger was kindled against us. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our help is in the name of the Lord. You know the rest of that, don't you? who made heaven and earth. And so as my second conclusion, if you had any doubt of it before this story, you better believe it. It's not just words that we say at the beginning of the worship service. Mm-hmm. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Don't ever think that God will not do us good or evil. Don't ever think that any other superstition can help you. There's no horoscope, there's no fetish, there's no good lucky rabbit's foot that's going to help you. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven <coughs> and earth. That's what Rachel learned. She doesn't give thanks to the man breaks. In verse 23, after verse 22, she thanks God. And then she names and Joseph, which I think means God will give me another son. <coughs> and she's putting her trust in the Lord to give her that. Alright? Let us, uh, let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a God who sees and sees to our needs. A God who hears when we are in misery and hears in order to help us. A God who will never leave us and never forsake us because he will never forget us but will remember us remember us in order to deliver us out of the deep and turbulent water of this world that we <coughs> seem to be tossed aimlessly. Father, help us to remember that there is no such thing as fortune, there is no such thing as luck, there is only providence. Our help is in the name of the Lord who provides for us. Help us to remember this. We put our trust in you this afternoon. In the context of our lesson, we also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I see you watch over your people. Thank you.